live without your love. Jesus died on the cross. God, we come to you at this yeah. time in yeah. the name yeah. of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 Thank you, God, for yeah. another day. Yeah. Yeah. The record said, this is the day that the Lord has yeah. made. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. Father God, you didn't have to let us sit this day, but God, we thank you. Thank you, God. That you allowed us to see another day. Thank you, God. God, thank you for our life, for our health, yeah. and our strength. Yeah. Thank you, God, for all that you allowed us to do for this day. Yeah. God, thank you, my Father, for giving us the privilege of God to come to the house of worship. Oh, yeah. oh here we are one more time, oh, yeah. God. Thank you, God. Calling yeah. upon your name because you're worthy to be praised, oh, God. Oh, yes, you made us all, Lord, you know all about it. Yes. You know whatever is happening in this world, God, you know all about it. Yeah. Father God, you know the condition of our world today. Yeah. So God, we look into the hand who is coming to our hands. Yes. All of our hymns come from you, God. You made us, Lord, you know all yeah. about it. Yes, sir. You know our heart, Lord, you know our mind. You know our situation, I pray. Let oh, me your heart for you, I pray. Yes, sir. Let me see God. Yes, sir. Let me see your heart to be, I pray. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we'll get us together, those of us that are here in this building. Give us the strength to listen to your word, I pray. Yes, yes, yes. Pray for the skin, oh, God. Give him the word that he may teach your word, oh, God. Let the world know that the reality is serving the truth. Yeah. And the living God, I pray. Bless those that are at home, wherever they may be at this time. Let us be focused on you, God. So the Lord is able, oh God. You're able. You did it for Daniel, God. Yes, sir. I believe yes. for all of us, I pray. Oh, have mercy tonight. Oh, bless everybody. Bless those, oh God, yes. that are sick in the hospital. Lord, you know about them, God. You know what they need, I pray. You know who they are, my Father. Lord, you know where they are. You know their condition, I pray. Oh, have mercy upon them right now. Oh, God, we pray for our world system, oh God. Pray for the election, oh God. You know what's going on, oh God. You already know, God. Who's going to be in position, I pray. Let us do our share, God, that we may uh, be a part of it, I pray. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. Again, we pray for everybody tonight. Uh, pray for churches all over the land and country. Pray for preachers everywhere. Oh, God, I pray for pastors, oh God. Oh, God, pastors need you right now. Oh, have mercy, God. I know how they must feel sometimes. Oh, God, if the flock is going to listen, oh God. If the flock still doing the right thing, help us, oh God, to be about your business, I pray. It's all about you, God. It's all about you. We love you, God. We praise you. Yes, God. Bless you, most wonderful yes, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, God. much for listening in and for being a part of the, the study for tonight. Uh, used to be a television program years ago. Still love this guy. I watch it every now and then when it comes on. His name was Gong Pa. And he used to say, surprise, surprise, surprise. So I know some of y'all got surprised. Y'all thought it was some uh, uh, recording from last Sunday. No, we're here on Wednesday night. Our, uh, our choir is doing that rehearsal, so I just asked them just to get started with uh, a song and just leading us in our, in our worship and, and time of uh, the study of God's word on this evening. So it's a blessing again to be with all of you, and we're grateful and thankful to see all of you, uh, those again that are present, uh, part of the, the Bible study tonight. Thank you again for your presence uh, on, on tonight, and we ask that uh, as we move forward, you would just continue to uh, engage in the study of God's word uh, because ultimately that's the thing that God is uh, most pleased with. Uh, I know some of you had the availability of the handouts for uh, uh, that were sent through the email. If uh, you don't have one, I do have some available. If you want to, uh, to share with that tonight, please make yourselves uh, available to that or avail yourselves for it uh, for those of you who will. And if you would, just just grab on this side. And if anybody, you see anybody that wants them, just... Uh, Go ahead and give them to him. Uh, we, we're going to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is going to be our, uh, our study for this particular evening in Daniel chapter number 9. I'm going to ask that you would go ahead and, uh, and turn there just for our edification. And, of course, uh, one of the things I do want to share with you, there are no blanks or anything like that to fill in tonight, but what you can do on the basis of the, the, the handout that is available for you, what you can do is uh, just use the handout. The passages are actually Daniel chapter 1, 9, I'm sorry, 9, 1 through 19 are actually on the, uh, the handout. 
so you can use it. But there are some things that I want you to do with the handout, just by way of observation uh, in the text. Again, for those of you that are watching by way of Facebook, YouTube, and the like. So it's just a, an, op an opportunity for us to kind of interact, if you would, with the text. So let's do that. We're going to go now to uh, the study of the Word of God in Daniel chapter number 9. And the subject matter that uh, we uh, just entitled this particular text is uh, the community prayer of confession for the nation. The community prayer of confession for the the nation. So what we're going to do is just spend some time just kind of unpack that and help us to see a little clearer what God is teaching us in his word as it relates to uh, Daniel and the prayer, if you will, that, uh, that Daniel prayed. So we just want to focus on that for the moments that God gives us. One of the things that we do know is that we are Christians. I'm going to say, let me say it this way. We are a nation of Christians who happens to live in the nation of the United States of America. Does that make sense? We are a nation of believers who happens to live in the nation called the United States of America. So, so what we clearly understand is that the things that God has assigned for us in his word uh, preempts, I'm going to use that word, preempts, Anything else that we know as far as America is concerned because it preempts even the Constitution because uh, long before 240 years ago, the Word of God was already there. And so we operate according to, again, according to the Word of God. One of the things that reminds us of that is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. And we're just going to just again for our edification. But you are a chosen generation, a royal, I'm sorry, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people but are now the people of God. And I think Reverend Skinner preached last Sunday we were the children of God who had not obtained mercy but now what have obtained mercy. That's, a, that's, a, that's an important factor because what it helps us to understand is that, is that God, God looks at us differently sometimes, I'm going to say it that way, then, then we sometimes have a tendency to look at, at, our, at, our, at ourselves. I still, hear sinner, I still hear Christians say, I'm a sinner. And I still, and I'll be looking at where do, you, where do you find that in scripture that says that you are a sinner? I am, I am absolutely a believer who needs forgiveness for sin, but Jesus died so that I might be saved from sin. And so do, I, so do I still commit sin, things that are contrary to the will of God? Absolutely. But, but, but for all intents and purposes, there's nowhere in Scripture where God describes me as, quote, unquote, a, a sinner, if you will. So, so what we do is that we look at ourselves in light of what, how God refers to us. And so he says that we are, again, special people to him. Uh, we are called out of darkness into his light. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So we are that within the nation of the United States of America. So, so let's just kind of walk through this in terms of, here's the first thing that I want you to see. The handout is already here. The, the redundancy is going to be there in terms of the reading and the like. But the need for confession was and is always related to the knowledge and obedience of the word of God. The need for confession. I think it's important that we understand when we pray, watch, we say, forgive us what our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So we understand that confession is a part of the reality of those of us who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ. The Bible would tell us in 1 John uh, chapter 1, it says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So confession is a part of our reality and the word confess, especially in the, uh, in the Greek language, is the word homologeo and it means to say the same thing. The word homo, same. The word legeo is again a root word of the word logos. It's, it's, it's to say the same word. You know, uh, God, God don't call it a white lie. He just call it a lie. 
you know, we have a tendency to kind of water it down and the like, but it is what it is. Again, it is what God calls it. So we're to confess those things. So what we're doing tonight is looking at the life of Daniel. And one of the things that we find out uh, with Daniel, verse, verse 1, verse 2, we're going to read those. It says, in the year of Darius, the son of Asuherus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, meaning the scriptures, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, remember, you don't have to look in your Bible if you don't want. If you can train yourself to just look at the paper, the, the text is right there on the paper, if you would choose to do that on tonight. And then, and then the key is, if you would just, if we would turn now in your Bibles to Jeremiah 25, just for a moment. Jeremiah 25, and we're going to look at verse 17 of, uh, I'm sorry, verse 12 of Jeremiah chapter 25. Because what we're looking at is that in this process of Daniel praying, this prayer of confession, he knew that the reason that he needed to pray it is what God said in his word. So how do we know we need to confess sin on the basis of what? The word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 would remind us, it says all scripture what is given by inspiration of God and is good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God what might be thoroughly equipped with for every good work. So we know that confession is necessary, confession of those things that are against the will of God. They are necessary because God commands us to confess, right? So in Jeremiah 25, look at verse 12. He, he, it actually gives us, and that's what I love about the Bible. The Bible interprets itself. You know, one prophet will say one thing, one apostle will say one thing, but you find again that it's actually affirmed all throughout whereby they are actually uh, fulfilling or show the fulfillment of what was prophesied. In verse 12 of Jeremiah 25, it says, Then, I, then it will come to pass... When 70 years are completed, this is God speaking, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for the iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Now, here's what's awesome about that. God had already prophesied. Uh, you think about it when you read the, uh, the book of Habakkuk. And uh, in, the book, in the book of Habakkuk, when he asked, you know, uh, uh, Habakkuk asked the question, Lord, how long is this going to go on? But when Abaca was asking the question, Abaca was really asking the question from the standpoint, how long are you going to allow the people of Judah to do harm to the people of Judah? In other words, the, with, there's some cutting up that's going on in Israel right now, some cutting up that's going on in Judah right now. So he says, Lord, how long is that going to happen? So when the Lord begins to explain it, he says, he said, I tell you, here's what I need you to do. Write the vision, make it plain. So he that reads it will run. And I know some people take that verse sometime and you make it sound like a good thing. But that, that in Habakkuk chapter 2, the vision is not a good thing. It is a dreadful thing. It is a harmful thing. It is an act of judgment that God is saying, I'm going to take the Chaldeans or the Chaldeans from Babylon, the most treacherous people you ever want to meet, and I'm going to use them to correct uh, Judah. And watch this. What they're going to do, they're going to come here. They're going to uh, siege, besiege the city. They're going to take all of the people that are well and all of the young people that are the nobles and all the strong people. They're, gonna, they're basically going to dismantle the army. They're going to take all the people of influence, and they're going to take them to Babylon. And I'm going to take all of you out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, for, for 70 years. So now that, per, that prophecy has already been given by Jeremiah. So now Daniel, when he recognizes that Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon is no longer in power and the Medes and Persians have now overcome the Babylonians, Daniel starts to think, wait a minute now. I know the word of God said in Jeremiah that we would be in captivity for 70 years. Now that the Medes and Persians have overcome the Babylonians. Wait a minute, something else is going on here. So he recognizes that exile of 70 years is almost over. 
So, so when you look at the notes, uh, Daniel, Daniel had been in exile 66 years, y'all. He went in there as a teenager. At this point, he's an old man. He'd been in exile 66 years. He, had many, uh, he, uh, he and many others had been taken captive in 605 B.C. Darius the Mede overcame the rule of Babylon in 539 B.C. So if you're doing your math, that's 66 years. So Daniel recognizes now, we only got four more years to be in captivity. So now... He goes and he reads the Bible, he studies the word of God, and he recognizes that God has given an answer to that. It's pretty much, you know, it's almost like right now, people are always talking about the end times have come. And I said, no, no, no. God has made that plain when that's going to happen. For as long as the church is in the world, the end times ain't coming. The, the indicator that the end times have arrived is when he takes the church out of the world. So until that happens, if you, can, if you say you're a believer and you're still seeing other believers and you're still praising and worshiping and studying and doing all those things that a Christian ought to be doing, then it's not the end times yet. It, we will know when the end times come. Why? Because the Bible has told us when the end time is going to happen. So even though we see wars, rumors of wars, all that kind of thing, it doesn't mean that the end is yet because the church is still here. Does that make sense? All right. So now, what happens, look at number two. Because God is the covenant keeper, because God is the covenant keeper, in other words, I'm sorry, before I move on, recognizing again, anytime I know I need to confess anything, where do I find it? In the word of God. Anytime I now need to know that I need to, to ask God for forgiveness for anything, I go to the word of God. The word of God points it out to me because there are times that I'm saying as a husband, I'm not loving my wife as Christ loved the church. So I have to confess. I have to say that to the Lord, right? So here's the second thing. Because God's covenant keep, because God is the covenant keeper, confession of sin is the personal and corporate responsibility of everyone in the community. Everyone in the community, all of us who are believers, it's part of it's for all of us. No, the use of the personal pronoun we, us, and our, they, those, them. That's in we'll see that in Daniel's prayer. But here's the key thing: he uses predominantly the words we us and our, he uses the term they, those, and them only six times. Because that's an implication there that, that if we're not careful when it comes to sin, we'll say is they, those, and them. <laughs> and it's not we, us, and our, because I always, if I say we, us, and our, I always got to be, I got to include myself, right? All right, so now look, notice what happens in verse 3. Then Daniel, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Again, that word, the word of sackcloth, or the, it's a lament that includes wearing itchy sackcloth and ashes on the head. In other words, that was the sign that a person was mourning for their sin, that they were sorry about what they had done. They would literally put on kind of that burlap sack thing. They would literally put on material that was itchy, uncomfortable, to remind them of just how grievous their sins were. And then they would, you know, you take ashes, literally ashes, something that's something burned, and they would take those ashes and literally put it on their heads just to remind them of, of just to be sorrowful, if you would, using that word, for what they had done. So now, he would say, uh, Daniel said, I put sackcloth and ashes, and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome, who keeps his covenant with mercy with those who love him, Notice that language, and those who keep his commandments. He's including all of the believers, all of the believers in the, in the language of those and those. But here's what I want you to do now. At this point, the handout that you have, every time you see the personal pronoun, we, us, or our, underline it, circle it, or something on your, on your handout, if you will. Look at verse 5, and here's what we really want you to do. Underline all of verse 5, first of all. Underline all of verse 5, and then maybe just put a circle around the words we. Underline all of verse 5 and then put circles around the word we. Notice what he says in verse 5. We have, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. 
even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Verse 6, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our, ki to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it, it is today. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Notice what Daniel is doing. Daniel does not exclude himself from the admission that there's been sin. He doesn't exclude himself. And what's amazing about when we studied, when we studied the book of Daniel or we studied the life of Daniel, there's nothing here that we can actually look at to say, well, Daniel did something wrong. You know, we can look at the life of Abraham. We know Abraham lied. Uh, we can look at the life of, uh, of Isaac. We know Isaac did what his daddy did. He lied, said, you know, that Rebecca was his wife, was his sister. Uh, we can look at the life of Jacob, and boy, we got a lot of stuff on Jacob. <laughs> Uh, we can we look at the life of Moses. We understand the temper that Moses had, all of those kinds of things. But there's nothing we can see in the life of Daniel that's written in the scripture. But, but the fact that he confessed sin says he did. Which says to us, other than Jesus Christ, there was no perfect human being. Can I get a witness in here? So anytime what we look at is that what God is saying to us is that when we look at ourselves in light of God's word, not, not comparing myself to Lena or to Rankula or to Judy or to Gail or to Warren or to anybody else, I always got to look at my life in light of God and in light of God's word. And when I do that, I can recognize that there's always some area of my life where I can actually be better. So it doesn't give me the opportunity to point the finger to talk about they, those, and them. It's I, my, we, our, us. Because what it shows is that when we talk about the community, it's all inclusive, you all. We, we, we you know, you know any time that we hear a scandal in the church, it, it's not a matter of it hurting that church. It's a matter of it hurting the church. Does that make sense? The, the church suffers whenever there's scandal in the church. Does that make sense? Sometimes we want to say, you know, they, this is what they doing over there. But in reality, we can't change the fact that it, why, why? And we think about ourselves. Uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He refers to us, what, as the body of Christ, correct? Many members, one body, correct? All right. Anybody, anybody, anybody at all been to the doctor the last year? Everybody, everybody been to the doctor at least one time the last year. If it was just for a checkup. All right. Now, here's my question. If you had something hurting, you need something to get the check out, which part of your body didn't go? The whole body had to go because the whole body, what it, it is, we're all connected to one another. So when one hurts, we all should because the Bible, what the Bible actually tells us. We, 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 we mourn with those who were mourned, and then we rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? Because we are interconnected. So Daniel does not exempt himself from recognizing that he has sinned before God. And, and, and when you, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it right now, but when you get a chance, if you can look, you know, when we, when, we, when we think of the book of Second Chronicles, what chapter comes to mind? Seven, right? But I want to encourage us, maybe even tonight, read chapter six, because chapter six is really the prayer that Solomon prayed, because Solomon recognized uh, that, that as a result of the children of Israel's rebellion, remember Solomon was a king, and one of the things that the Bible said in Deuteronomy 17, that the king was to have a copy of the scriptures, right? So Solomon understood when you read Deuteronomy 28, one of the things that God had said in Deuteronomy 28 in particular, um, and I, I, think I, I think I had, you, you'll see it on your handout on the, 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 uh, the, the next page, 
In Deuteronomy 28, verse 48 through 57, and also Deuteronomy 28, uh, 64 through 68, it was actually a curse that said, if you all disobey me, and again, it's on the, it's on the opposite side of your page, he said, if you disobey me, one of the curses, the greatest curse that you're going to have is I'm going to take you out of the land. So Solomon understood that because of Israel's disobedience, that one day they would be taken out of the land, but what were they to do? They were to pray to God. They were to confess their sins. They were to repent from their sins, and then they believed that what God would do what? He would heal the land. He would allow them to be restored uh, back into the land. So now let's keep going. Look at number three, because now we get into verse number eight. Number three says, In the appeal for the Lord's mercy and forgiveness... Confession must be both general and specific. General and specific. You need to be general and specific. Now, notice, notice how Daniel does that. Do this for me again. Underline, underline verse 5. You did the verse 5. Underline verse number 8 now. Also verse number 8. Underline verse 8. And notice again what he says. Oh, Lord, here is the language again. You, you remember you circle in the pronouns? To us belong shame of face we're embarrassed by what we've done in other words what what he's saying what and and it, and it could and it could just very well be something as much as nobody saw it but the lord but if the lord saw it terracula it's worth confessing <laughs> it's worth admitting it so he's saying unto us belong shame of face not only to, to our kings our princes and our fathers. Why? Because we have sinned against who? Against you. I mean, think about, think about Psalm 51. Psalm 51, when David is praying, he says, Lord, I have sinned against you and you alone. And you're thinking, wait a minute, dude. You, you, you sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against Uriah. But what he was, Uriah, but he, what he's saying, though, ultimately, our sin is ultimately against God. And basically, once we sin against God, everything stops there. When I sin against God, confession is necessary. Because here's, 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 here's the reality. Most of us would have to admit, we actually think it before we do it. <laughs> and so if I think it, sometimes just thinking it is enough to confess it. I'm not by myself, am I? I'm thinking. <laughs> We just think it, and that's enough to confess it as far as, as far as God is concerned. Verse number 9, he says, uh, to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. That's, that's God's, that's God's uh, uh, love and kindness toward us, y'all. It's just, it's called his hesed. It's, it's, his, it's, it's, it's him keeping from us what we honestly deserve. Grace is God giving to us what we do, what we don't deserve. Uh, mercy is actually him holding back what we what we, what we, he gives it one way, one way he gives it, another way he holds it back. And so he says, uh, mercy and forgiveness, meaning that uh, whatever I confess, I need God to forgive it, forget about it, not hold it against me. That's what he's talking about. Though we, here's that word again, rebel against him. Verse 10, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he said before us. By his servants, the prophets, or we would say today, the pastors, the preachers. Verse 11, underline that verse, if you will. Underline that verse. Underline verse 11. Because uh, here we have another, this is the third time in the same prayer that Daniel prayed that he's confessing sin. The third time in the same prayer. I started thinking about that, but I say a lot of times I pray, but I don't confess it as much as I should look like. Notice again what, <laughs> what Daniel is saying in verse 11. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law. We've gone into areas that we shouldn't have gone. We've done some things that we shouldn't have done and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, going back again to Deuteronomy 28, uh, the servant of God have been poured out on us. Why? Because we have sinned against who? Against him. We've sinned against God. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us, bringing upon us a great disaster. 
For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. What he's literally saying uh, in, Daniel, in Daniel's time, in terms of Daniel when they're exiled, what he's saying, there's never been a time that you've literally seen that God, a God has taken all of the people out of the nation and allowed them to be placed a total different place. I mean, and remember that what makes it more egregious is because remember, they are the children of God. They are the people of God. These are the people that God delivered from Egypt, from Pharaoh. These are the people that God opened up the Red Sea for. These are the people that God took care of in the wilderness, 38 years. I mean, or, you know, 40 years. These are the people that God worked miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The other day we were talking about something, and I said, you know, when you know, talk about the glory of God, can you imagine what, what people must have felt like, Warren, when, when Israel was coming into that land? And, they, and, and remember talk about the glory of God was a cloud over them by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? Can you imagine, again, what that must have looked like to people? You know, they're looking from that city, you know, start seeing, seeing a cloud. Then they see a bunch of people under that cloud. And, and the more they look, the closer, the closer it's getting. That had to be a, oh, don't let them come at night. I'm talking about a pillar of fire. <laughs> You're like, oh, my God. You know, so these were the people that God had so blessed. But what had they done? They had rebelled against God. They had, they had, they had start worshiping idol gods. They were no longer or listening to his voice. They were no longer doing what God was telling them to do. So therefore, God says, okay, if that's what y'all going to do, I know how to deal with you. I know what I need to do to get your attention. I know what I need to do to cause you to recognize that what you are doing is not pleasing in my sight. So here's what I'm going to do. This land that y'all love so much, I'm going to take you out of this land. And I'm going to put you in quarantine. I'm going to put you in isolation for 70 years out of the land that you're used to being in. Isn't that something? I'm taking you out to show you again uh, Again, for, watch this. At the end of the day, I'm going to do that, but I'm still loving. I'm going to do that, but I'm still caring. I'm going to do that, but I'm still merciful. I'm going to do that, but I'm still forgiving. But I'm going to demonstrate to you who I really am. Um, uh, he, he says it in verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Now, now listen to this verse. Uh, yet we have not made our prayers before the Lord our God. Is, is that a sad verse or what? As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster, all these calamities, all of these hurricanes, <laughs> all of these, these wildfires, all of this snow, we, all this coronavirus, <laughs> all of these disasters have come upon us, Daniel is saying, and we have not prayed. That's sad, bro. That, that is one sad verse. I mean, to, to see that as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayers before the Lord our God that, watch this, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Here's what I, I, said, I, said, I said it this morning. All of us, all of us, this is a good time for all of us to be taking some inventory of ourselves. Because we all admit we got some stuff in us that God don't like. We got some stuff in us that we don't need to be doing. We got some things that are going on in our life. We know it's contrary to the word of God, right? So, but, but what God is saying, in the midst of all that's going on, the reality is that, that, that some of us not even given an attempt to try to change. And when this is over, when, when, when God allows this coronavirus to be gone, when the pandemic is gone, when the protests have stopped, when, we, when the political unrest is no longer there, what God is saying that many of us are going to go back to business as usual. 
as though nothing ever happened. <laughs> That's what Daniel is pointing out. We, we are in this disaster. We see what's going on, yet we have not prayed about our own. And watch, iniquity is the stuff that is in me. Iniquity is the stuff that is in me that, that when I can be smiling in leaner face and thinking something crazy in my heart. Yeah, the, the iniquity is the stuff I can really hide well from y'all, but I really can't hide it from God. <laughs> that stuff, that stuff that is resonated in me, it's in me. And God is saying, in the Daniel is admitting, in the midst of all of that, we've still not repented. We've still not changed. We're still doing the same thing. We're still acting the same way. We are living in a time where death is all around us. And he's saying, in some cases, we're still going about business as usual. Whatever it was we were doing in March, we're still doing it in October. And November about to come. <laughs> but God is saying, all this disaster, all this disaster, all these calamities, all these things that are given indications that God is getting our attention. And we're still doing the same thing. We're, we're, we're about done. He says, therefore the Lord, verse 14, has kept this disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God, why does he do that? It's righteous in all his works which he does. Though we have not obeyed his voice, and I and and now, O oh Lord God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Isn't that something? He's admitting it again. So again, if you want to underline verse 15, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Wickedly. Now, here is the thing, folks. Here's the thing. I know what somebody's thinking right now. Well, I ain't done as much as somebody else, but if you did anything, that's the issue. And that's the thing that Daniel is talking about. It doesn't have to be an issue of a big sin or a little sin. It's what has been done. And if it's been done, God is saying it's important to confess it. It's important to admit it because what we recognize, we may not be doing everything everybody else is doing, but we're doing what we're doing. Here, number four, and we're about done. In light of the Lord's righteousness, confession must be followed by petitions, requesting for his sake he turns from his justified wrath. Yeah, when we, when we, 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 we recognize that God is righteous, so, so we ask God to do what? To forgive us, not, not, not because of us, because we're admitting I was wrong, but for your name's sake. For your sake, Lord, uh, you think about it, you think about it, in a, and, I, and I often say this is my favorite verse in the Bible. To me, it just kind of solves everything else that I read about in the Bible as it relates to Jesus and our relationship to him. He says in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin be sin for us, that we might become what the righteousness of God in him. So what it's saying is that none of us can excuse ourselves because we all have the righteousness of God, which means that we have the ability to make the right choices. We have the ability to make the right decisions. Matter of fact, we have the ability, watch this, not to sin. That's what he's telling us. So now what we recognize that when we don't do that, we are violating his righteousness. It's not his fault. But we do ask him to forgive us on the basis of his righteousness. Does that make sense? Lord, you are a righteous God. I violated your righteousness, but I'm asking you to forgive me because you told me based on your righteousness that if I pray and if I repent, if I change my mind, you will forgive me because you are a righteous God. So what am I, what am I counting on? I'm counting on his righteousness in order that I might be forgiven for my unrighteousness. counted on that. Lord, I, it's right because you said it's right. But I'm admitting I'm wrong. I'm admitting. I'm admitting I'm wrong. When, I don't, when I'm not loving Suge like I ought to be loving it, I, as a long time, I try to come up with excuses. I say, Lord, I messed up. I just, I just played old messed up. I messed up and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I know about a couple of days I walk gently because I recognize I messed up. It's like, I'm man. 
Ooh, I messed up, man. I mean, boy, back in the day, I, I, I messed up. Boy, it used to cost me a whole lot of money to mess up. Ooh, Lord, man, I spent a whole lot of money trying to make up for my mess up. You know, uh, thank God she's matured, I'm matured, so it don't cost me as much money no more. It don't cost, it don't cost. <laughs> but, but when it comes to that, I got to appeal to God, Lord, based upon your righteousness. Please, please forgive me. And that's all I can count on. I can't say, I can't, watch this, I can't tell him I ain't going to do it no more. Lord, I ain't going to do that. I stopped praying that a long time ago, too. I ain't going to do this no, uh, boy, I tell you, because here I go sometimes. That very thing that I said I wasn't going to do, start thinking about it, do that very thing. And I know again, he's going to forgive. But I shouldn't do it, why? Because I know he's going to forgive, right? So he's saying, what I got to count on is because you're a righteous God, I got to count on your righteousness in order that I might be forgiven for my unrighteousness. Wow. Who are we? Verse 16, same thing. If you want to underline that when you can. Oh, Lord. According to your righteousness, I pray let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Listen, you know what we're facing today? Absolutely. I think we can see evidence that God is judging the world, right? One of the things that we never want to do as Christians is to act like we ain't had nothing to do with it. The Bible clearly says judgment begins, first of all, in the household of God. That's what he says. It starts with us. There are things that God is saying to us, that God is getting our attention about, that he wants us to recognize that some things we need to confess, some things we need to admit, some things we need to change. And, and, and the issue is, is that um, in some cases... You know, we got a world that's looking out at us and say, you see, you see, you see, you see. Sometimes we say stuff and it don't sound Christian. And the folk in the world say, oh, 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 I thought you were supposed to be. Even in the midst of this pandemic, we say some crazy stuff sometimes that, that God didn't say that doesn't please the Lord. And, and, and sometimes we are going along with things that are, people are saying, things that people are doing. And what he's saying, we become a reproach to the world. They're looking at us and like, oh, okay, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. So you going to talk to me about faith? Why are you tripping? You telling me about trusting the Lord, go to church? What, what, why are you tripping? Why are you, you know? So he's saying that we become a reproach. So here's the, here, was, here was the issue in, in a, in a in Daniel's day, what he said, the nations around us, the, those, those Gentile nations around us that, that, that we, in our own way, for as, uh, the Jews were concerned or Hebrews were concerned, those that we put down because we all of that, we of Abraham's seed and all that kind of thing. He said, now look at y'all now. <laughs> look at y'all now. You know, that, that was it. You are a reproach. They, it was, so, look, just look at y'all now. Y'all don't even have a city to live in. Matter of fact, y'all got so angry that y'all, he kick y'all out. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so he's showing that they, it was a reproach. Verse 17, now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds but because of your great mercies isn't that something we're not we're not saying lord i'm i'm right and so lord i deserve for you to treat me better than this and lord i you know i've been i've been praying through this coronavirus and i just know lord you ought to treat me better than this and lord i've been bringing food to people's houses and so lord i just i just believe you ought to treat me better. he said it ain't got nothing to do with my righteousness but it has everything to do with what? His mercy. Lord, hear. We're done. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. For Just for edification tonight, in closing, go to the book of, of, of Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we're going to close tonight. Hebrews chapter 12. Book of Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews.
Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we're going to go. I'm just looking for something just right quick. Thank y'all so much. Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 12. And I want, I'm just picking up at verse... Uh, Pick it up at verse 7. No, no, verse, verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And a lot of stuff going on, folks, don't, but don't give up. Stay encouraged. And the reason being, he says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Still got some work to do. God is still giving you the ability. He still wakes you up in the morning, so he still give us another chance. Sprinkle wake us up throughout the day. He's still giving us another chance for repentance, for change, for transformation. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. This is lo love language. Watch it. Watch this. For whom he, well, for whom the Lord loves, what does he do? He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Because he says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, without disciplining, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, verse 9, we have, we have had human fathers who corrected us. And we paid them respect. Shall we not more readily be in subjection <clears throat> to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems good for the, for the, for, I'm sorry. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. <clears throat> my daddy, my daddy, Elvin Skinner, was a strong man. You know, picking up bales of hay as a young man. He worked at a feed store uh, in Ville Platte, so he was always lifting sacks and all of that kind of thing. And uh, I, I remember 1015 West Beach Street, 70586, Ville Platte, Louisiana. Um, 6808, I'm saying, yeah, 68, 68, 8, 6808, Los Angeles, yes, 6008, thank you, 6008, Los Angeles, um, for those three years that we lived there, 74, two cattle, and boy, I tell you, my daddy, my daddy, my daddy would whip me sometime, Lena, and he was so strong, there wasn't no need of me trying to fight him, you know, he could hold me, and he could hit me in the same spot as much as he wanted to. He was just that strong. He was, he was that strong, you know, just that strong. And I'm telling you, those whippings were rough. As far as I was concerned, that was rough. That was rough. And while it was happening, man, that was some rough stuff. But later on, I learned that was some profitability from those whippings because those things corrected some of this stuff that this bad boy wanted to do. I have to admit, I was kind of mischievous. I was... I was mischievous when I was, Judy will tell you, Judy, Judy will tell you. I was, I, uh, I could be kind of hard-headed and bad sometimes, you know. But my dad would correct me. And what I recognized that those chastenings were for my betterment. It wasn't just a beating just to beat me. Because he used that to get me where I needed to be. Let's not forget, God allowing some things that are going on in our world right now. <laughs> but he's using those things as a tool to get us where we need to be he's getting our attention he's hopefully he has our attention but now that he has it let's do what we need to do to to, to re re recognize the importance of the community uh prayer of confession uh for the nation and when i say for the nation i'm not just really just talking about the united states of america i'm talking about the nation of believers the nation of christians the nation of those of us who are followers of the lord jesus christ father god we love you again and thank you so much just for the blessing of life we thank you for your goodness your kindness and we pray uh today lord for rella and her family who are having a burial system this weekend we do pray again for family in Bastrop or 
they're going to have their funeral on Saturday, and it all goes well. We ask again you continue to keep Milton and Rella and Mary and Ethel. Um, keep them safe and sound, Lord, and, and, and help them to, uh, to sorrow, but you said not as those who have no hope. Sister was a believer, and so we believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in the life of Sister Doris Addison. We're hearing that things are getting better. Um, Daphne is saying she recognized that no news is good news. And so we thank you, God, for what you're doing in her life. We do pray for Sister uh, Chandler. We pray for Brother Clyde. The Lord is good to hear the report that Clyde is getting up out of bed and Clyde is sitting in a wheelchair and all that kind of thing. So, Lord, thank you so much uh, for what you continue to do in his life. We do pray again uh, for uh, so, so many of our members who are going through seasons of difficulty, sickness, disease. Thank you for Sister Doucette, who had a surgery and is doing better. We thank you for her recovery. We pray that it would be a, a, a total recovery and she might be well and refreshed moving forward. Once again, for all of the members of our church, uh, from Sister Phil, to Kobe Bryson, we ask again your continued blessings upon each of our lives. And more than anything else, Lord, help us to live blessed. Uh, we ask these things now in the name of your Son, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Until we meet again, God bless all of you. You all take care.